Hello, well, welcome to this podcast. This is Elijah. This is Vitor University, and uh, we are here today with Aaron Enten, and uh, we're going to have a wonderful com- conversation. Uh, I let him introduce himself, and we can go from there. Thank you so much for being here, man. Yeah, it's great to be on. Great to be participating. Um, I'm Dr. Enten, Aaron. Um, a little bit about me and my background. Um, my doctorate is in cell and tissue engineering focused on uh regenerative medicine and um although very heavily focused in that area my career has been very heavily pointed at how do i apply my knowledge and scientific skill sets to impacting patient lives and really driving access to preventive health care oh wow prevent preventing is yeah. always better than actually like dealing with the outcome uh can you yeah. tell us a little bit more specific about like the process and your clients uh, it's all over the place for depending on the uh the type of industry that you're looking at right but most of the world today tends to have a very heavy focus on uh reactive medicine and interventional medicine it's a i am as a patient i am sick and therefore i'm going to go to the doctor and we've gotten really good as a society at providing that level of care especially for the patients who require that level of care but there's a whole shift in the industry and the market now toward preventive care and preventive maintenance mm. if especially for diseases where if you don't catch those diseases early enough they can cause permanent disability or damage mm. it's essential to actively combat that disease early in its progression or else suffer the consequences oh, wow. so that's where i spend most of my energy and efforts is how do we mm. try to shift the care pathway to one of prevention this is interesting um so as you may know ai takes a lot of the space right now in the for the predictive uh simulations and experimentations how do you think ai it might already use in your business but like how do you think ai can help um basically in this process yeah so ai is not only used in inside optics which is the business that i currently head up mm-hmm. um but it's used in the industry as a whole across the board in a number of different manners mm-hmm. um a lot of the industry right now is very heavily focused on how do we use ai to pair with current practices to effectively replace the skill requirement and training of specialized practitioners so that we can reduce their burden mm-hmm. right so that's like you may have seen uh google and their recent uh mention of their ai retinal exam and how it can help to predict recurrence of that patient being admitted to the hospital again in the future and helping those types of patients to get better quality of care and identify them earlier So that's a whole subset of the market where it is oh, wow. let's use AI to recreate what doctors are doing and make better predictions of that care. Hmm. The area of the market that I'm currently working in and that Inside Optics is focused on is how do we take that skill set and make those exams at a lower level more accessible to certain at-risk patient populations. right so the example that i like to use there is if you are a patient living in a rural part of your country or territory you're going to ultimately have access to maybe a primary care physician uh probably some kind of local clinic mm. and although the staff there is very well trained for general disease diagnostics and maintenance they're not trained in how to conduct specialized exams mm. we may still be a few years off from well this ai can do what this doctor does and better and faster and we may eventually push into that space 
But right now we do have the capacity to take AI tools and use them to say, hey, we know that an exam requires these five components or, and this level of quality and this level of feedback and insurance and off the shelf computers and hardware. And we can put those into those rural clinics so that a nurse practitioner or a technologist, they may not have your results right then and there with a certain level of sensitivity specificity, but they can record that content get some preliminary information, determine if it is sufficient for a specialist somewhere else to provide a diagnosis, and then set up all of that data out to them. So at Inside Optics, we're very heavily focused on how can we enable those people that do have access to the patients to give those patients the care that they need where they already are. Interesting. This is very, very close to what we do, um, but we kind of call it simulation, right? So um, in our industry, we are basically bridging the gap between knowledge and wisdom using simulations. Right now, we could test different variables, do micro calculations, build systems that are that basically practicing the outcome of a knowledge that normally it takes in real life. It takes money, it takes resources, it takes like a whole building or a, or a lab environment. But right now, using simple words, because AI knows chemistry, AI knows math, AI knows all these different rules that we can apply and constitutionally, right? So rule one, rule two, two rule three, this is the final goal. This, this is the example output that you produced based on those rules. So these with NLP right now, system creation is possible. And we believe that simulation is at the core of AI, like AI is... Um, basically built to do simulations. If you think about ChatGPT, ChatGPT is basically a, con uh, a simulation of a conversation, right? And usually you ask questions, that means you want, you have a variable, which is that question from that. But normally you could build something and then give other sort of variables every time and get the same report that you designed. And that report is the extracted insight and wisdom from that document, right? Um, it's very interesting. So, you, you know, like um, right now, universities as a single organizations, we believe that they're incapable, fully incapable of knowing the practical knowledge and pipelines of every other business in, in the world because it's they're only one and there's millions. Right. So, yeah, there's a lot of information, a lot of data and parsing that data can be a challenge. Exactly. And th if you think about it in business, we discover new practical things on daily basis, including softwares, processes, workflows, and we invent efficient ways, right? That universities don't even know. So doesn't that make sense for us to teach our future workforce and have a department that we call it university, as opposed to, you know, like uh, having like an entire uh, university that would just focus on like teaching people and would con imagine with translation of that knowledge that they teach the students is a grade is the examination and that grade goes to the education part of your resume right if you're selling so the, the, the um, experience part is almost like impossible to have after university because you only have the grade and people are looking at the experience they want to know if you're practical if you can accomplish things do the task actually they don't care about what grade you have and some I mean, it depends on the institution, the interviewer, what the entity is looking for from uh, a potential applicant, right? University and what you learn there is may not be immediately or directly applicable to a specific skill set. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the skills that you learned for how to apply certain principles or tools doesn't mean that you can't take that skill set and apply it to a new set, right? Yeah. So an example there is like, I currently teach part-time at University of Washington here in Seattle. Um, and although um, a lot of what I teach is how to span interdisciplinary practices, uh, how do you take knowledge from a different area and apply it into the area that you are currently exploring as an engineer, even though our use case is very narrowly defined, the general broader context of 
How do I have a conversation with someone outside of my field of expertise? How do I mm. take this knowledge and learn something new? How do I apply these techniques and skills in domains that I don't have experience with is those are all still incredibly valid and very useful for whatever you're going to be doing in a 100%. practical context, Level. right? But, but let me tell you one thing, even the, the way they teach writing is wrong. Why? Because a university professor said that from University of Chicago, because the way they write it is for you to, for the teacher to actually see all those 5,000 words and then grade you on it. But in real life, your writing should be, shouldn't, isn't based on the words you write. It's based on how practical it is, how useful and valuable it is. In less sentences is your email. That's how people are going to read it. It's fast. It's useful to them. It's catchy. And Instagram, again, I'd say it, you know, it varies. It depends on what you're debate. trying to achieve right uh, yeah, you yeah. know if you're if you're writing a a blog post then the message may matter less than the consistency of your post frequency mm -hmm. and putting that content out there may matter more right versus like writing an executive memo if i'm the ceo of a company and you're writing a weekly message to me to inform me of what has been accomplished and what blockers are preventing you from making progress I may want that to only be two lines saying we were able to complete company objective 27 and mm -hmm. I need this person or this tool or this skill to achieve the next milestone, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it depends heavily on your audience, who is providing the instruction, what you're attempting to achieve as your outcome. There, There's a lot of variability that goes in there. and. Yeah, if you took a class in undergrad that said, write 5,000 words, I don't care what's in it, that may not be directly applicable to the things that you're doing now. That doesn't mean that learning how to write and synthesize information and apply your thought into a structured format isn't practical knowledge, right? Mm, you're absolutely right. But my point was just really just writing long in order to prove in order for a topic yeah. to deliver the meaning behind it you know what i mean yeah. and that's what university practices with people so i see people every day and the way they're talking is that they are fluffing a lot like they have a lot of different mid sentences they they, they say a story in middle and like they get distracted so it's it's really not that practical and you can tell this is like the university jargon that like is applied to them, you know, in their brains. Um, but OK, so in general, I have one good question from you and um, I want to know the honest answer. So, yeah, if it's possible. So uh, I'm saying, would you rather work for a business right now as a prof and uh, teach your uh, future workforce, teach the future workforce, get actually like a return on learning for the company and company encourages you based on your performance because they can, re they can see how much money they're making based on the people you teach. So your performance could be rated in the more justice way. You know what I mean? Compared to how it is in university, you're not going to get paid if, uh, more if like the students get better grades. I mean, you might, but like, that doesn't mean that the student is That's like not how, university systems are not you don't you don't get paid if your students get better grades and if you did you'd just make the assignments easier or you'd make the criteria you'd have to find a way to separate out mm -hmm. the grader from the incentive structure right that would be an inverted incentive right and like do you think that should work on commission more cuz like i think if a good teacher can make more revenue for the more revenue for the company or like more um, good employees for the company, good systems. That's like the core of the business. And like, that yeah. should be- But you don't need a professor to do that. And you don't need an education structure to build in uh, efficiencies and effectiveness within your core team, wow. right? You can have inefficiencies even in a university context or within a business context. And uh, mm. ultimately, it, at least in my opinion, what is valuable is ensuring that you're openly communicating objectives and measurable outcomes with your team and 
ensuring that they can improve not only themselves, but also the pathways that they're operating and navigating within whatever context uh, they're placed within, right? So if I'm in a university system, openly, if I don't have a syllabus, mm -hmm. then I suddenly give you a midterm, you're going to do bad. It's the same if I'm in industry, mm. uh, if, you, if you're my employee and I don't say, hey, this client requires this report by this point in time in order for us to close the deal, mm. you're not going to have that report done in time, right? But it's even a step further than that. That's just a deadline. That's just the time bound nature of it. There's no, we haven't even talked about like specific details or measurable outcomes or the resources that go into creating that content. And there are tools that exist in both university and industry to ensure that your students are effective at learning what they need to learn and that your employees are effective and have the tools they need to complete the job that you need them to complete, right? Absolutely, yes. You know, um, after a lot of research in my life and like getting familiar with software and law, um, I realized that all the sifts, all the systems in the world are created for a purpose, right? Even yep. when we create a software or create a website, it's like usually to serve that purpose. It's a system, it's a bunch of rules. And for example, a tree is a system, right? The, the goal of the tree is recreation and like the fruit feeding other animals. But when I think about um, like the, the practicality of these things, what is practical for a tree, right? There is water, there is sand, there's like good um, light. And the same thing applies on human. What is practical for a human? Um, we we kind of can't actually like divide everything in the world by half, by what's practical and what's just knowledge, right? And by doing that, we realize a lot of the things that we're doing, they're not actually prioritized based on this filter. And that means that we're doing things that we think are right, but they're not doing things right. So it's like, I mean, that depends on how you're measuring mm -hmm. your intended right or not right. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's, uh, let me, let me, let me just because example. something is not practical. So even, mm -hmm. so let's apply that train of thought to a business mm -hmm. context, right? Okay. Um, the, if you were to look at it from the context of does this, is this, if we define success as you're increasing the, the top line or decreasing the bottom line, right? You're either making yourself more efficient or you're increasing dollars for the business, right? Because that is the sole purpose of the business. Mm -mm. You as an employee spending time educating yourself, it may not actively be in the best interest of the business purely from that context. But if you take it and you extrapolate it, and from that knowledge, you can then apply new models, skill sets, softwares to improve the efficiency of yourself or others, mm -hmm. that may help to reduce the bottom line, which may feed back into that model, but it may also not. And even if it doesn't, you now have an, um, I, if you were my employee and you were going out seeking additional education, and it was costing me additional time, resources, and anything else, mm. having you be a smarter employee as part of my team with greater exposure may still be valuable to the company, even if it's not measured in the context of revenue or cost. Absolutely, right? yes. So I think it really boils down to what is your definition of success? Well, and for business, money is success, right? So that's how you can <laughs> uh, measure it. It is and it isn't, right? Mm -hmm. You can be a B Corp and not a C Corp. And in a B Corp, you have KPIs that are mm -hmm. benefit oriented. And it may be that you want to achieve a certain impact for a certain subset of the population. If you're a 501c3 nonprofit, revenue has nothing to do with what you're trying to achieve as a company, mm -hmm. right? So again, just because it's not immediately useful in a very specific or niche context does not mean that it is not useful to that individual or to mm -hmm. the company as a whole 
or even within an entirely different company or skill set. Absolutely. Um, do you think education should be free? I think it depends heavily on the environment that it operates within, right? Yes. It should not cost you an arm and a leg to go get an education. And everyone should have at least some level of education, right? Exactly. So everyone has to pay. That's what you're saying. Everyone has to set some money aside to go dedicate their brain to get taught. And then I don't know if it's specifically be, be money, but you should. Right. I feel like you should be setting aside some time, right? Mm -hmm. Educating yourself. And this is not, I want to stress, this is not strictly formal education. Mm -hmm. You can go to a trade school and get an education on how to apply that trade. And that's still an education, yep. right? You're still learning a skill set that you're applying, whether or not that's how to derive a second order differential equation for beam dynamics or what the fire safety code rules say for how to lay electrical lines. Both of those are different types of education that require time, effort, and oversight. And time, effort, and oversight cost money, right? Mm. It takes other people's time, effort, and input to right. provide that education. That is totally my point. That's why for them to have that money, they have to be a business, not an individual organization that don't know how the business, how the practical outcome of that education is. Because like you're not learning to forget. You're learning to use, right? Otherwise, you'll yeah. forget. That's how human mind works. So, But again, there are different kinds of businesses, right? C-Corp and for-profit nature is only one kind of business. And I've already given three or four other examples for different ways to structure that. Mm. But there are also positive consequences that extend beyond just, is there money to be made off of this point in your life pathway as an individual, right? A better educated population is likely going to generate more GDP for the country as a whole, even if a single individual doesn't leverage a specific subset of knowledge in the way that it was intended to be leveraged, right? I agree, I agree. But so like, does that mean that mm. that person should be fully responsible for their entire education and should be obligated to commit that specific education in a specific anticipated way? No, I don't think that's a valid approach to providing education to individuals. Well, if right? I'm, I'm going to hire them and that's like what I want to extract from that person as a society, it makes sense for me to teach it, right? So it's like I teach, I hire, and they earn and learn. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're describing an internship though, right? No, you no, I'm not you sure. don't want to pay them a full salary because they still have a I lot won't. to learn before they can be an effective employee, exactly. but, but they, you can't pay them nothing because that's not fair to them or their time. But they haven't so, wasted their time in university. They're useful now. Like I'm going to pay them less un unless they're useful. That presumes that their time at university was not useful. I, and I disagree with that premise. I totally understand. But personally, I am a bachelor of science from computer science in Bruno university, London. I studied three years sure. uh, and a half. And um, I was in a, basically, I paid $60,000 uh, pounds as an international student. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, I'm actually deep in this. I was a teacher ass assistant. I was, um, I did a lot of um, like PAL certificate and like STEM yeah. stuff in the university. And if like in the, that area that I was good at, which was AI, visual effects and motion graphics and like Python, I knew that the university is lacking, like huge. Like I'm telling you that they are, they were like really for, for your specific education for whatever application you are assuming you wanted to apply your skill set to, right? That, and, and that's the forefront of technology in the world. Like, why should a university lag in that area? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm... it again, it depends heavily on how you define your success. I mean, computers, right? do, you, technology. do you feel that your education mm -hmm. had zero value to an employer? Uh, I almost think yes. Z yeah, not zero, but like maybe 10, 10%. That doesn't make me pay $60,000. If I could provide the other 90% some other way, I would definitely sure. do it. 
-hmm. So then the question is, is because coding boot camps are a thing that exist in the world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they are significantly cheaper, claim to provide immediate beneficial skill sets through the recreation of existing frameworks and tools and have a job placement success criteria that allows you to warrant the fee for the course that they're providing. So in that context, why wouldn't everyone go to a coding boot camp for eight weeks instead of? Awesome question. A business, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm saying the coding Or instead of a university, right? Why university. would you go? Why would you? Why would anyone ever mm -hmm. elect? Or the same for like trade school, right? Why would you uh, out of high school only ever go to trade school to learn instead of university to learn? If you, for example, wanted to start your own electrical engineering business, right? If you Let wanted to be you. an entrepreneur, then it doesn't need to be strictly coding, but you may need that education from a business perspective. Exactly. Yes. So you need to but work then in a business. You're basically just creating intermediaries, right? No, I, we're creating a fractional university. That's what VFitter does, really. You know, so we, we have a contract with teachers and we have a contract with businesses. We we get the practical knowledge from businesses. We give it to teachers and the teachers teach it to the future workforce and we pay the future workforce. Well, that's just curriculum design, right? Exactly. Does, did your universities, no grades, professional employees have like curriculum review or curriculum criteria they that did. they were required to meet? They did, they did. And I actually um, told them that we lack the software ZBrush, we lack, lack the software Blender, all these uh, different tools that we needed, they lacked. They even had the hardware for it. So they knew that they had to afford something like this, but the software direction was mi uh, missing. They didn't know why they have this. Did you make that proposal to any of your teachers to I say, did. this is something that I feel should be incorporated into this specific class? Yes, sir. I did. Like, what was the response? Nothing. After two years, I heard from one of the students that took placement because he had one year off. So we were not in the same year anymore. I told the guy, he said, okay, now they applied it finally after two years, but they're very slow to adapt universities. And that's fair. It depends on the professor and the university, I think, right? I change my curriculum quarterly. Interesting. That's yeah. Perfect. I, I, I but that being said, you know, I have colleagues and I've worked with people in my past who were teaching curriculum from the 1970s. There you Admittedly, go. That's exactly Richard Feynman saying. did a lot of his work in the 70s and it is very seminal work and some of it is required for a lot of what we're doing today, right? You do need some level of foundational knowledge. I, I'm curious to know uh, what... It sounded like you were in university for a three-year degree. Yes. You very likely received some level of core education that said, this is what a for loop is, right? You have to start at ground zero for mm. something for so that everyone can build to the same threshold. Did you eventually get to like electives that were operating at the forefront of what you're trying to do or look at what... Uh, a master's degree or equivalent in the field might be given that foundational education? Yes. I had a master's degree friend that were in my uh, group. He was also a teacher assistant with another girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to them. I saw their final year projects and like, I was good at like visual effects and all that. So yeah. um, they know, they knew me because I go to my teachers. And I'm like, look at my work, look at my work. And so this guy, uh, the final year project was so simple, I could make it in a day and offer it in the whole uh, university and like get my master's degree. And in, in, in my industry, it's all projects. Like you just have to offer the projects at the right deadline and then you get the degree. So it's not freelancing. Like, yes, yeah. it's not exam, right? So kind of like- I mean, you're, you're describing mm -hmm. freelancing and coding boot camps. I, no, 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 no. Whether or not those education, and I would, actually flip it on its other side there are definitely coding boot camps that exist mm -hmm. that are teaching like how to build twitter infrastructure from 2000 and what 17 mm -hmm. and i can make the argument that 
that's not useful to exactly. what Twitter is trying to achieve today. But the, again, you, that doesn't point, mean though. that that skill set isn't mm. valuable or useful. Let me tell you one thing. You're missing one point. So I'm saying even universities and coding boot camps, they're all in the same bucket because they're individual learning organizations. They sell courses. They don't sell results. And that's the whole problem. You have to sell the mm. results. The result is for I don't know. I think hired. you might want to go look at ABET accreditation and requirements from state level organizations. At least in the US, mm. there are very strict requirements that you have to meet in order for your curriculum to be considered accreditable, right? They're removing That's... that. They're removing that. I no, they absolutely are not. Uh, I, I promise than... you that accreditation is an is a core requirement for every university in the US. But what if that companies is... remove that? Companies are the outcome, not the universities. Universities are the supply. Like they're they're g giving grades. Universities give you yeah, grades. They're but not the grades are grades. The grades have a certain the educational content, the curricula that is required to be provided to the students has to meet certain requirements that are set by accreditation boards that are external to the university. It's not entirely internal. Right. If I wanted mm -hmm. to teach a class on how to build a new software or how to build a machine or do a capstone senior design project with Boeing as an industrial partner, mm -hmm. I can't as a professor just go and say, I'm going to do X. Right. I can say that, but it needs to fit within the accreditation requirements set forth by the external board. Got in it. order to provide that education to the students okay so they, is, there's is a requirement on me as the as an instructor but right? isn't that accreditation of that that you talked about that uh, all these parameters shouldn't business specify those parameters since they're they're the one no. using those education they're the outcome of it the, they're the one paying really like they're the one paying shouldn't they decide what's useful and what's not useful they can decide what's useful within their company. That doesn't mean that they should have any say over the type of education that you are receiving as an individual at a university. But that should be a useful education, right? So what's useful? The grades? I don't think the grades are as useful for these companies. They want. I think results. you're conflating. Mm. I think you're conflating grades with learned knowledge. You can have straight A's and learn nothing, exactly. right? You can also learn nothing and have straight F's, right? Grades and what you were able to extract from your education as a useful skill set are not inherently tied together. Totally Grades agree. can be representative of a set predefined course objective, and those objectives ideally should be aligned with skill sets that you can apply. But again, if I'm teaching you how to conduct beam dynamics equations and calculate second order differential equation sets, just because you don't go into a fissure mechanics lab with Boeing or a contracting uh, construction company doesn't mean that doing that math wasn't a useful skill, right? Mm. It's like It's like saying, if I'm doing AI as a, as a course, right? And I want to teach you uh, tensor-based systems. And then you go and get a job at, I don't know, call it uh, Amazon. And you're working in their database backend area and they don't touch tensor at all that doesn't mean that your education on Tensor was useless. You still adopted a new knowledge set. You were able to apply it to a project. You were very likely able to navigate pre-existing repositories and workspaces. Mm. And all of those skills are things that you can apply to AWS database management, even if that's not what you learned, mm. right? So I don't, I think there's a, a mismatch in, in, in what you're trying to say is a outcome from the university and an outcome from the student, right? 
Yeah. It feels it feels like you were unhappy with your education because it didn't apply to the specific jobs that you were looking for. No, if no, I'm being no. if I'm being blunt. No, no, no. Right? To be honest, I became a business owner and that's I I realized what's important to me if I were to hire people. Sure. So this is like would I look at people's credits or like um certifications if I if I were to hire someone? No, I really want them to do that specific thing correctly and at I mean the right it depends. Time. It, it depends it on really what doesn't. the accreditation really and doesn't. what the certificate is. I if I want to hire a project manager and they have a project management cert certificate because they went through a project management program, I can be relatively confident that they know how to conduct project management, right? Mm -hmm. It can help me to at the very least build a screening protocol and minimum expected knowledge set as a business owner. I totally understand, but I know many people that wouldn't care, like my business fr friends. Sure, you know, it's, but that's it's because your thing. business and your requirements have different outcomes and objectives, right? No, because AI is out, really. Like, you know, the AI by itself is like, it's very huge. Like, people don't understand the outcome of this in creating abundance, really, on Earth. And we're going to get to the point that, like, we don't need to work. Then, then money wouldn't even have a value anymore you know like when there's no jobs when there's i mean no... that argument has been made for decades maybe even a century or so now within the u.s specifically mm. um and if you'd start to look at maps of like gdp versus productivity mm. there has been an immense spike in productivity and gdp has aligned mm. usually it's a balance of you become more efficient and therefore you can get more done. And now there's an increase in expectation of what you can achieve as an individual. Exactly. And how practical you can be. I agree. Yeah. Totally. But that's not going to fully displace everyone's job and then require that no one can ever work again. That's not, that's a very simplistic outlook on industries as a whole, especially in the short and midterm. I mean, right? to be honest with you, if it's a construction job and it's dangerous, why not replace it? Wouldn't it even be I, better? Ideally, ideally, you wouldn't have to, right? But, but like, it's unhealthy. If, if for that human. job, if if I'm a, a bricklayer and I have mm. created a new system that can lay bricks, I have now also created a job for maintaining the system that is laying the bricks. And mm. it's not just a we need to build that machine that is building that is laying the bricks there's a maintaining that machine there's education and training around conducting and operating that machine right mm -hmm. crane operators require additional training in order to operate a crane they have to right mm -hmm. you can't just be like it exists and it's done no mm -hmm. right even if i were to have an ai that is managing a lot of that or helping to provide that real-time feedback Mm -hmm. There's now people that need to not only build that AI, but also monitor that AI for successful intended outcomes. Absolutely. You can't, and this goes back, to, I was talking very early at the start of this about applications in the medical field, right? Mm -hmm. This is, it's very important for you to be constantly observing the outputs. Yes. And as an AI person, you know that the data sets govern what the capacity of the system is going to be. So you can unintentionally bias your data and you need to have people that are not only looking at data and its clarity and use in that mm -hmm. system, but you need to be you need to have people that are monitoring the outcomes of that system to make mm -hmm. sure that it's not biasing the data in specific ways. You need to make sure that you're not artificially skewing results one way or another. You need to make sure that there's efficacy and efficiency that's built into that as the data sets continue to grow. And those are all roles that people need to be able to oversee because even in unsupervised AI where it's learning on its own, it can come to conclusions that are unintended and have negative consequences that are really problematic for people and society as a whole. You just nailed the arguments. These roles that you just said is not even in the universities being taught right now. 
So yeah, that's but my, exactly my debate right here. You, my argument is that mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere, right? You you as an individual won't if you want to become a data engineer mm -hmm. and you want to start to manage data sets so that you can help to eliminate bias from those data sets, you need to start with what is math? That's probably grade school, mm -hmm. right? You need to advance into how can I use math in computers? That's mm -hmm. probably high school, right? You need to be, how can I build algorithms so that I know what an input will result in from an output? That's probably early undergrad, right? You need to be able to build small projects that are very rudimentary that allow you to investigate what data sets are and what their structures look like and how biases might begin to occur. Mm -hmm. Now you're looking at late undergrad, maybe masters. Perfect. And then and then you're getting into, all right, well, I may be able to be trusted with a preliminary data set under supervision of someone practical in the field. And it feels like your argument is, well, cut out the steps from build a basic project to become somewhat trusted with a data set because I have the experience and exposure no, to no, know no. what data inputs and outputs look no, like. No, no, I no. want to jump from I can do a coding project to mm. I can manage a data set. No, and no, that's not. No, my debate is who teaching it. Like the steps are fine. I absolutely agree with like step one and step 10. And like the this is in between. My argument is who is teaching that steps? You know what I mean? Is that person sure. working for the university or are they part of a business? That so then your argument the is business. businesses should be universities. It, yes, it shouldn't be universities. It should be the business because then it could be customized based on the business's practicality. In businesses, there are confidential information that universities don't even have access to. So if you're sure. practicing with the data, you you need to be the business to know what works for you. To you you might have cho cho chosen like, i think that's a really extreme inefficiency to and burden to place on a business solely for the purpose oh. of maybe expediting the the pathway of the individual but i stress maybe expediting right mm -hmm. it's not a guarantee that it will take less time or cost less than a university based system it's really right? who hires the prof it's really the difference is like who hires the problem. I think it even a step further what? if we because we were talking earlier about unintended consequences type this type of structure has existed in the past where it's a like the coal miners need to have homes and they need to live near the coal mine. So why doesn't the coal company be the landlord for these people? Thanks. And the answer is because the company then abuses that privilege oh. and ownership rights and creates really terrible working environments or that ultimately benefit mm -hmm. the bottom line of the company because that's what matters to the company. And it's a, it's a contraindicated incentive structure that mm -hmm. may not be an effective approach to achieving the desired end goal. You can structure, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. you can structure it, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can find a way that benefits mm -hmm. everyone across the board. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's not feasible, but I, I am saying that mm -hmm. there is a lot uh, that mm -hmm. may need to go into consideration here that is going to be incredibly variable and not controllable from an accreditation standpoint mm -hmm. because the ultimate owner of the education and the responsibility for that education is going to be tied to the business. And if it's a C Corp, the business is going to be tied to increasing their top line and decreasing their bottom line. And that will result in creep that is not going to be beneficial to the person that is seeking the education. Absolutely right. It has to be implemented very well. But um, the way I look at it, it's really it's super easy to be to be honest. It's just like the who hires the university It's just replacing one person and uh, beginning a new department. It could be fractional. It could be an actual department in another uh, business that is called university part, like university department of that business. 
which still prior so I guess prior mm -hmm. my let me ask you a question then mm -hmm. um in this whole framework that you've built mm -hmm. why not petition accreditation boards to include a certain frequency of review of curricula and content and ensure that industry-based partners can provide reports on information that can be incorporated into a university-based education. Absolutely. But can university take all of those knowledge and deal with them? Or are you saying- that They've done it with the accreditation boards to date. Why not mm -hmm. add one more criterion? Why not say that there needs to be some level of relevant direct information? So take Georgia Tech, for example, a university in the Southeast, mm -hmm. right? In undergrad, they have a requirement for their students to not only pursue electives that are immediately industrially revel relevant, mm -hmm. but they also have a requirement for graduation for their undergrads to pursue external internships relevant to their field of study. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's not something that's required. That's something that they just elect to do. Mm -hmm. that also Why works. not try to create something that is similar in that vein, but not a requirement or burden on the student to pursue that type of education, but take it a step further and make it a requirement for accreditation for the university to incorporate that type of knowledge into their curricula. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And um, if I start from the beginning and like we can wrap it up in like 15 minutes. Uh, sure. When we started like getting old enough to go to university, what is the promise of the university for us as like an individual being? So the promise is I want to, I, ch I charge you so I could occupy your brain and put stuff in it. Like some of it is well-rounded education, but some of it is professional knowledge that I grade you on it. So then you can take that grade and go find a job, right? But I think that that's depends the on the education uh, source. I mean, Right. Like that's the typical workflow, right? That's the standard workflow of like find going to university, finding job, right? Or you have to uh, the yes and no, right? You, <laughs> what do you mean? You I, what if I went to trade school? Or what if I went and started my own company? Or what if I wanted to yeah, code right. as a freelancer at, and pursue internships for two or three years for and then go yeah. seek a job? I agree. Uh, just but the I would not say is, that yeah. there is a standard and that it is expected, I agree, right? I agree. At yes. least, at least until back in the '90s, yes, it, you there was an expectation that you complete high school and go get a job, mm -hmm. or you complete high school and you go get a higher education to pursue more advanced educational requirement-based positions. Yep. I would argue that that is no longer the standard at least in America, right? There is an expectation that you are getting some form of education beyond high school in order to pursue a career, but it does not need to be a university, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Yep. That works That's as long as it's part, practical. Yeah. That's, that was at, my whole at point. At least partly because the most jobs require that you have a, an applicable skill set that you can leverage and just because you don't have a degree does not mean that you cannot get a job. Exactly. It means that your barrier to entry is higher, mm. right? Yes. It'll be more difficult if, if, let's say that you and I were to pursue the same job, mm. right? Mm. And you have an undergraduate degree and I have a PhD and MBA. Mm. And this, this can be flipped around. So I'll give you the, the contrary example as well. If we are both applying for a senior engineering position, mm -hmm. then it is much more likely that the company that is doing the hiring mm -hmm. is going to be more interested in my resume and career path and the ability to provide that to their needs internally mm -hmm. because the PhD and MBA combined usually imply that I have further education than you, assuming everything else is equal. 
Mm -hmm. If I have a PhD and MBA and you have 20 years experience as a senior developer and I have one year experience as a senior developer, they are probably going to favor you over me in that mm -hmm. same context exactly. because you have years of experience in the exact role that they are hiring for. Mm -hmm. You could even flip this around the other way. Let's say that I cannot get a job that would warrant a PhD and I start applying for entry level positions in a new career. If I, if my degree is in bioengineering and that is my, what my doctorate is in and your undergrad degree is in software engineering and we both apply for an entry level software engineering position at Facebook, mm -hmm. they are likely going to favor you as the potential hire because mm -hmm. your educational background even though a lower level of commitment mm. to academia is more relevant to the position that is being hired for. Mm. And ultimately it is a conversation of what is your experience? How is it relevant to the position? And how does it benefit that company and what they're hiring for, Absolutely. right? And there are a thousand ways that you can find a match for that content. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. This was actually very amazing. Um, I feel sorry it ended up being so, more uh, more controversial it, and it is awesome. People love it. Debate. Viewers love it. <laughs> <laughs> like and subscribe. Um, follow our channel. And um, thank you so much for being here, Aaron. If anyone would like to reach out to me and learn more, I'm always happy to have conversations. Feel free to look up Inside Optics and www.io.care for the things that we're doing in AI, computer vision, machine learning in medicine, and how to prevent disease. Thank you so much for being here. Bye, everyone.